We're here to pray, so pray. Come on right now, just keep. Church, pray. We must pray. Oh, we must pray. We must pray. We must pray. We must pray. after me. Say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory one more time for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever amen amen I'm going to share a word tonight, and we're going to go right back into prayer. You can go up back to your seats. And how many know we have to pray? How many know we must pray? Tonight, we'll be praying all night till 6 a.m. Every hour on the hour, there'll be a word of direction and prayer, a declaration, so to speak. I see many people brought their prayer shawls tonight. I feel excited to have mine. And there'll be a word of direction from the Bible every hour with a declaration of what we'll be praying for this entire evening. But one thing I know for sure is that we must pray. Just look at your neighbor tonight tell them we must pray. This church, this church here, Victor Arch San Diego, must be in a perpetual position of prayer. If you're here from El Cajon tonight or, or Vista or San Isidro, we must pray. And the reason is because if the enemy comes to steal, it's in the absence of prayer that thieves can take over the church. Should I say it again? It's in the absence of prayer that thieves can take over the church. And right now, in the book of Matthew, chapter 9, I'm going to begin reading in verse 14. I feel that tonight, this message here is going to kind of set the tone for what God is doing. It says, in verse 14, it says, Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, 
why do we and the Pharisees fast often, but your disciples do not fast? And then Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? He says, but the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. He says, for the patch pulls away from the garment and the tear is made worse. And no one, uh, nor do they put new wine into old wine skins or else the wine skins break. The wine is spilled and the wine skins are ruined. But look at this. It says, but they put new wine into new wine skins. I want everybody tonight to say new wine skins. It says, and then both are preserved. Tonight, I, before we pray, the scripture is very important to how it pertains to the move of God here in our church in regards to open heaven and shifting and, and the power of prayer because Jesus came to establish a new and everlasting kingdom and he desires to fashion instruments for the purposes of that kingdom. Instruments for the master's use, instruments that can lead a move of God and as I've been really praying and really pressing in with God and really seeking God's face, I've been discovering that the fires of revival burn according to the intensity of those leading it. And understand that the enemy's assignment is to steal your fire. Because if the enemy can steal your fire, he can shrink down everything attached to you. Look at your neighbor and tell them, protect your fire. That's why we must pray. Because the absence of prayer causes thieves to take over revival, take over the church. In this story, the Pharisees questioned Jesus as to why their disciples did not fast. And what Jesus says to them is something very important. He says, the time for fasting is not now. The time for fasting is not now. Jesus tells them it's not for them to fast now because during a wedding or during a honeymoon, you don't fast. During a wedding, you feast. During a honeymoon, you party. Come on, somebody. You don't go on a fast during a wedding or a honeymoon. But what Jesus was saying to them is that this was the disciple season for feasting. Because their disciples were walking with their master. I believe that this is an important word for what God is doing in your life right now. Is that right now you are here and God wants to bring you into a season of feasting on his presence. He wants to bring you into a season of feasting on his power and feasting on the fresh water that he is pouring out. What was happening is that the disciples, as they were walking with the master, they were being introduced to new things. How many of you can say this is a season where God is showing me new things? They were receiving the keys to the kingdom. And what was happening is the Pharisees we're operating under an old system, an old system, an old thing. The very reason why Jesus came is because the Pharisees had stacked on hundreds of traditions on the word of God. There's one scripture in the Bible in the Old Testament where King Josiah was roaming through the temple and he found the word of God. Imagine for a moment that in the temple, the word of God was lost. Come on, somebody. 
They were no longer teaching the word of God. They were no longer worshiping. They were no longer praying. They were caught up in rituals. They were caught up in systems. They were caught up in tradition. And Jesus said, now is the time for me to come and really teach them what the power of the kingdom is all about. The disciples were smack in the middle, middle of a kingdom shift. Now, I want to talk to you for a moment about the principle of the wineskin, and then we're going to pray. Are you with me? The principle of the wineskin is this, is that there comes a time when old things must be replaced. Old things. Someone say old things. Can no longer sustain something brand new. So as we have been praying as a church, I've been reflecting in my spirit, in my heart, in my time with God. I've been reflecting with God and asking questions of God. I've been asking God questions about past moves in this environment. There have been seasons where there has been outpouring. There has been seasons where heaven has been open. There has been seasons where there's been fresh fire, fresh rain. There have been breakthroughs through seasons, but as I've been inquiring of the Lord, I heard the Lord very clear speak to me as day as you could hear it. God said, tell my people not to pray for new wine, but tell them to start praying for new wineskins. What the Lord told me to tell you, Victor Outreach San Diego, is that if you're praying for fresh wine, you're making the wrong prayer. He says, I don't want you to pray for fresh wine. We've had wine in the past. We've seen seasons of breakthrough, but somehow that wine begins to leak. Why? Because God is not looking to give you wine. He's looking to give you a new wineskin. He's looking to give you a new life. He's looking to give you a fresh start. He's looking to give you a transformation. Come on, somebody. How many want to see a new wineskin in your life? So if you've been praying for new wine, you're praying the wrong way. This, this evening, tonight, this new season is about new wineskins. There's two reasons. First is because new wine cannot exist in an old wineskin. The old skin lacks the flexibility to hold the new wine for a sustained period of time. You know, you know the principle. When they would begin to uh, get new wine, they would go and make a fresh kill. How many feel like tonight we're going to make some fresh kills? There was a fresh kill, and they would sacrifice an animal, and they would take the skin, and they would, that skin would be warm and soft, and they'd sew it up, and then they'd put the grape juice in it. And as the grape juice began to, f begin to change and begin to ferment in cooperation with the skin, they worked together. But if you take fresh grape juice and put it in an old wineskin, the old wineskin is inflexible. It can't move with the changes. You're not saying nothing to me here today. It can't move with the changes. So what would happen is the skin would crack. And then the Bible says that the wine and the skin would be wasted. So when you have a fresh wine skin with some fresh wine, Jesus said both are preserved. Both will be long lasting. The move of God will be sustained. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to have a visitation. I want a habitation of God's presence. I want to stay in the move. I want to stay in the revival. I want to stay in the fire. I want to stay in the stirring of the waters. I'm tired of stale water. I'm tired of stale services. I'm tired of stale Christianity. I want a fresh move of God. Does anybody want a fresh move of God? Say new wineskin. The second thing is the new wineskin represents a fresh move of God in your life. New wineskins equals revival in a believer. Revival is not an old patch on an old garment. God doesn't take a new piece of cloth to cover up a broken life. He doesn't take your broken life and patch you up. He doesn't take your broken life and put a Band-Aid on it. What the Lord says is he says, give me your broken life and I'll give you a new life. Revival is not a new idea on an old way of thinking. It's not a church growth concept. It's not hype. It's not hoopla. It's God himself moving amongst his people. It's, it's, it's transformation. Someone say transformation. New wineskin and revival is a new life in Jesus. Charles Finney said a revival is nothing but a new obedience to God. And I came to tell you that when God sends revival, he doesn't send it to the sinner first. He sends it to the Christian first. 
If you have been dry, if you have been weary, if you have been stuck, if you have been dealing with an old wine scene, get ready. Because tonight God's getting ready to do something brand new inside of your life. Your life is not going to be the same. Your family is not going to be the same. Your situation is not going to be the same. Because revival came for the believer. It's a brand new thing. It's out with the old, in with the new. Now, I know there are many of us here as we get ready to pray tonight. I'm only going to go a couple more minutes, is that, is that you're experiencing a shift. How many of you have been experiencing a shift? And I want to speak into that for a moment before we pray. How do you know you're having a personal revival? Number one is there's a hunger and a thirst. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and what? Thirst for, right, for righteousness, for they shall be made empty. No, that's not what the Bible says. It says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst, for they shall what? Be what? They shall be filled. The promise is that if you hunger and thirst, God will fill you. My daughter, Zanelle, is such a sweet and loving girl. She's organized, responsible, thorough, such a great help to her parents. But there's something that sweeps over her when she becomes hungry. (laughs) She becomes hangry. And this sweet, beautiful girl who's such a blessing, all of a sudden when she gets hunger pains, it just changes her whole mood. She becomes something else. She becomes a different character entirely. There's another side of her that's revealed. And what her spirit cries out is, I must eat. Don't talk to me until I eat. Don't talk to me until I get what my body is crying out for. What is hunger and thirst? How do you know you're having a personal revival? Who wants to hear this tonight? How many know you're having a personal? You know you're having a personal revival is when there is a singular passion for the presence of God. A singular passion that you're so hungry, you say, I must eat. I'm so hungry, I must eat. There's a story of a young man who came to the Greek philosopher Socrates because he wanted knowledge. And Socrates led this man out into the water. Then he grabbed the young man and he held him underwater till the man couldn't breathe. He was thrashing and struggling. And then he let him go and the man came up gasping for air and then Socrates left him. And then as he, the young man went to the shore, he went to the marketplace to find Socrates and when he, when he saw him, He said to Socrates, why did you try to drown me? Why did you try to drown me? And Socrates said to him, when you were underwater, what did you want more than anything? And the young man responded. He said, I wanted to breathe. I wanted air. Socrates said, when you crave knowledge like you crave air, you'll be ready to be my student. How do you know you are hungry and thirsty for God is because you have a singular focus. You say, I've got to eat. I've got to have more of God. I don't want anything else. Come on, somebody. That's how you know you're having a revival. Who tonight is having a personal revival? Because you see, I can't get enough. The second thing is this. I'm almost done. Is there's also a change of appetite. It's not only a hunger and thirst, but secondly, it's a hunger for more. Our hunger shifts from those things that are natural to those things that are supernatural. It's a desire for your supernatural to become your natural. Come on. It's a desire for what you're used to, to just totally change. How do you know you're having a personal revival? It's the shifting of an appetite. Understand that breakthrough is not just what you walk away from. Breakthrough is what you walk towards. And there's so many people that they think revival is just walking away from something. But the question is, what are you walking to? You know you're having a revival, not just that you got free, but that you're moving closer to God. 
you're more hungry for God. Your appetite is changing. Come on. You want to go from crumbs to bread, from bread to meat, from meat to strong meat. You want the meat that will equip you for the kingdom work. You want the meat that will equip you for revival. You want the meat that will keep you in the move of God. You want the meat that will grow your character. You want the meat that will change your mind. You want the meat that will change your heart. You want the meat that will change the way you talk. You want the meat that will change the way you act. You want the meat that will change your whole spiritual area code. You want the meat that says, I'm not the man that I used to be. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. I'm not the woman that I used to be. God has done a miracle. There's been a move of God in my spirit. Give me more. 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 Somebody say revival. How do you know you're having a personal revival? Is because your appetite changes. You want to, you no longer want to live in the natural. You want to live in the supernatural. And then the final thing is this, is not only is there a hunger and a thirst and is there a change of appetite, but lastly, before we pray, you can play softly, is there's a strong desire for personal change. For personal change. I came to tell you, brothers and sisters, that no matter what you've heard about revival, revival is not a miracle. Write that down. A miracle is something that we, you know, springs upon us and somehow, you know, is just only from God. But I came to tell you, revival can come from us. Did you hear that? Revival can flow out of the condition of our hearts. The Bible says the prayers, the effective, fervent prayers of a righteous man, what? Availeth much. And then it goes on to say, Elijah, a man being just like us, caused the rain to stop and he also caused heaven to open so that the rain will come out. Let me tell you for a moment, revival happens when the people of God are ready to change. It's when the people of God recognize that change is okay. Change is okay. Tell your neighbor, change is okay. But before change can be okay with your neighbor, change must first be okay with you. Most people don't change because they're worried about what other people are going to think about them. That's what the Pharisees did. They were so worried about what people would think of them. And Jesus said, okay, if you're going to stay stuck in that, I'm going to raise up some new instruments. Because change is okay. When you say to yourself that change is okay, that's when the Spirit of God can move in you. That's our prayer tonight is that the Spirit of God, before it moves through you, it first moves in you. That the Spirit of God, tonight, all night, all the rest of this year, all 2020, all 2021, all 2022, and every year after that, that the Spirit of God will move upon our hearts. That the Spirit of God will bring changes in our hearts. It's okay to change. When the Spirit of God moves, the Spirit of God desires to do four things. Number one, the Spirit desires to convict us of sin. Convict us of sin. The Spirit of God rebirths conviction in our life. And you know what conviction does, brothers and sisters? It alerts us to disaster. That's all conviction is. 
it's just alerting us to disaster. As we've been praying, I've been getting different messages on Instagram from people. Even myself, I've been experiencing this in my own sleep. Is people are telling me, Pastor, ever since heaven opened over our church, I've been having dreams. Who's been, have, who's been dreaming? And there's been people in your dreams. And there's been situations in your dreams. And I've had all kinds of different dreams. I've been dreaming that some of you are not going to get married. That's real. And the Lord, I said, Lord, what are dreams about? I begin to go to the Lord. And the Lord said, dreams are warnings. Because conviction makes you aware of things that are going to happen. The Bible says this in the Old Testament. You might read your Bible just like you do. The Bible says that God will not reveal it to his people till he's first revealed it to his prophets. Somebody say conviction. God does nothing until he first reveals it to his prophets. So if, if you're having dreams, if God is pricking your heart, if God is dealing with you, man, it's time to wake up and recognize this might be my moment to change. This might be my moment. This might be the shift that God wants to bring in my life. The second thing is the spirit de desires to convert us. There's a shifting of desires. There's a shifting of appetites. There's a shifting of character. There's a shifting from worldliness to godliness. Why must we pray, church? Why must we pray? Because the world has invaded our environment. The world, the world's thinking, the world's attitude, the world's style, many things of the world have invaded our environment and the whole goal of Satan, come on somebody, is to get the church to gravitate to the world. And if we don't pray, then we give way to thieves to break into our church. We give way to thieves to break into our lives. And you know what the thief came to do, to steal kill and destroy but Jesus said I came to give life I came to give life and more abundantly what is revival it's abundant life what is revival it is open heaven what is revival it's shifting from worldliness into the kingdom of God and then the spirit desires watch this to cleanse us and to control term spirit led who's heard that say are you spirit led you say i'm spirit led but here's my question are you spirit controlled are you spirit controlled i want to be controlled by the spirit of god you know before the spirit of god can control you one symbol spirit is water. Everybody say water. And water does three things. Number one, it refreshes you. Who could say, Pastor, I've been getting refreshed. The second thing water does is it cleanses you. Come on. Everything that was stuck to you Everything that was, imagine, it's like getting a power wash. You ever been one of those car washes where you pull out that gun, it's like, shh, man, I feel like God has pulled out the gun and he's been washing us clean, shh, getting off all that junk from the world, getting off all that compromise, getting off all that sin. I don't know about you, but I feel like a new creation in Christ Jesus. I feel brand new in the house of the Lord. Feel my skin. It's like baby skin. Can I hear an amen? Feel my face. It's softer than ever. Why? Because when God comes, he comes to transform you. He comes to give you a new life. He comes to give you a new beginning. That's what revival is. We are under a revival. We are under an open heaven. And it's when the spirit controls us that the greatest mark of revival and I've got to get this out and then I'm done then we'll pray I did pretty good on time the greatest
greatest mark of revival, hear me and hear me clear, is love. Love. But not an ordinary love. Tell your neighbor, not an ordinary love. A brotherly love. Three types of love, right? Agape love, phileo love, eros love. Phileo love being brotherly love. When does a church need revival the most? According to Charles Finney, and I've been quoting in the courtroom, haven't I? You're going to know everything about Charles Finney by the time 2020 comes. Hey, my pastor gave me that book. I'm devouring it, guys. But according to Charles Finney, he said, revival is most needed when the church loses its brotherly love. When we are in strife with the very person we sit next to in the house of God. When marriages are in strife, when the youth are in strife, when this ministry is fighting with that ministry and this person is fighting with that person and this person holds a grudge and this one has a grudge and this one has a grudge and they say, you know, I don't want to be here no more because I can't make any relationships. That's when the church is in need of a revival. How many know God is faithful when he sees his church in great need? Oh man, I'm done preaching. Come on, somebody. How, how many know this is a time for brotherly love to be stirred up? This is a time for forgiveness to be stirred up. God wants to heal your heart. God wants to heal your wounds. God wants to heal your spirit. Lord, send the rain, Lord. Lord, send the rain. Lord, heal my heart. Lord, heal my wounds. Lord, cleanse me. Lord, refresh me. Lord, fill me. Lord, heal my marriage. Lord, heal my relationships. Lord, cause me to rejoin with my brothers and sisters in the house of the living God. Come on, somebody. Lift up those hands and say, Lord, open up heaven. Lord, let it rain. 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 And you know, the Bible says this. Jesus said this, that if you have something against your brother, if you're holding a grudge, tonight, we're going to heal all the grudges. We're healing all the grudges. Come on, somebody. We're healing all the grudges. And, the, and Jesus said it. He said, if you come to the house of the Lord to make a sacrifice, he says, before you make the sacrifice, you must first repair the argument, the offense with your brother. Or what's the consequence? Your prayer will not be heard. Oh, Lord. And I'm the first today to stand before you with an open heart to you. To tell you and to ask of you for your forgiveness as your pastor, as your friend, as your brother in the Lord. I ask you to forgive me if I've hurt you with my words. If my words have hurt you, I didn't mean to do it. Sometimes I'm a little raw. Have you known that? And we stand on this platform and people lift us up to be something sometimes that we're not. C.S. Lewis wrote a book called Mere Christianity. He should have wrote a book called Mere Men because that's all we are as mere men, mere women. 
We carry the same flaws. We carry the same hangups. We carry the same fears. We go through the same sicknesses. We go through the same challenges. And we're just like everybody else. And I say that to you to ask you first and foremost as your pastor to forgive me for anything I've done wrong to you whether knowing or sometimes and many times unknowing just know that every intention that I have towards you towards every one of you all those of you that serve with me that have served with me for years is good Better than that, my intentions are God. When you win, I win. When I win, you win. We are family. We are family. And I ask you today to forgive me if I've hurt you, if I've hurt your family anyone connected to you please forgive me I, I humbly ask you for that but let's forgive each other at this time we declare and we decree that love will reign at Victory Outreach Center we declare and we decree that we will keep no accounts against one another. Mm. We declare and we decree that we will extend love and grace to one another no matter the season. We declare and we decree that when our brother is down, we will not throw dirt on him. We will pick him up. And we declare and we decree that when we are down, our brother or our sister will pick us up. On this night, we declare and we decree that heaven will remain open over a people who are willing to forgive one another. Tonight, we declare and we decree that we will be healed of past offenses. We will be healed of past hurts. We will be healed of past pains. Tonight, we declare and we decree that there will be no competition in the house of the living God. We declare and we decree that we will be God pleasers and not man pleasers. Who's ready tonight? Who's ready tonight? Tonight, I believe that forgiveness is going to reign in this place. And if you say, Pastor, I'm ready. I'm ready to rise up in forgiveness. I'm ready to be healed of my hurts and my pains. I'm ready to forgive my brother, and I'm ready to receive forgiveness from my brother and forgiveness from the Father. Lift up those hands. We will rise in your name. You can come to the altar if you want that healing. If you need that healing, come to the altar. We will rise in your name. Adonai, you reign on. We will rise. We will rise. Some of you are going to be broken tonight. In your name. I forgive my spouse. Every lie. We cast out every thief tonight. 
We cast out every contrary heart, every contrary spirit tonight. And Lord, we declare healing. Lord, we declare forgiveness. We declare restoration of the heart tonight. Oh, come on right now. I forgive my leaders. Lord, I forgive those who have hurt me. Those, God, who have injured me in this warfare, in this battle. Oh, we declare healing right now. We declare healing right now. Oh, Lord, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our trespasses. Forgive us, God, of our frailties and our weaknesses, God. Extend grace once again. Extend mercy once again. Oh, come on, right now. We must pray. We must pray. We must pray. We must pray. Close the door on the enemy, brothers and sisters. Oh, come on, that's it. We will rise, see, we will rise in your name, Adonai, you we will rise. Lord, I forgive. I choose to forgive. Let love fill my soul. Let love fill my soul. a fresh kill tonight. Come on, make a fresh kill tonight. Take out that knife. Make a fresh kill tonight. Come on, make a fresh kill tonight. Come on, kill that pride tonight. Let's kill that pride. Oh, Lord, we humble ourselves tonight. Oh, Lord. We humble ourselves tonight. Oh, we humble ourselves so that healing can take place. We, we humble ourselves, oh God. Oh, we humble ourselves tonight, God. The hurt, the pain, the hurt, the pain. Let it come up, God. Let it bubble out. Let the waters of your spirit begin to cleanse us, oh God. As those tears begin to flow, God. As those tears.